Name is Faith, an eight-day Bible study devotional for women based on the account of Naaman in 2 Kings. That's coming up next right here on The Parker J. Cole Show. Hi, and welcome to The Parker J. Cole Show. I'm your host, the Queen Parker J. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, we are going to be talking to my guest co-host and contributor today, Mary Jane Humus. She is the author of the devotional I just gave you. It's part of a series of devotionals about people of faith in the Bible. I can't wait to delve into this book in just a few moments. As always, we want to thank our Patreon team for their support. We have been showcasing Christian authors worldwide for the past 10 years, and as God gives us grace, we'll continue to do so. To find out how you can help out, simply go to patreon.com slash write stuff and see what you can do. And as always, we cover your prayers. To stay up to date with PJC Media, simply go to pjcmedia.net. Click on that pink follow button. You'll never miss a show. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay updated with uploads, updates, and more. Go ahead, subscribe today. Without further ado, I'm going to bring my guests on board. Mary Jane, how are you doing today? Hello, Parker. Thank you for letting me on your show today. And thank you so much for being with me today. I never take it lightly when our guests come on board. And today is particularly special because this is the first time we've actually talked and inter- interacted with each other. But we always talk on Facebook off and on. So this is really fun for me. Yeah, me too. I really was impressed with this book because you were coming from the aspect of Naaman. And Naaman is a story in the Bible that most of us are familiar with, but you did something different. You actually dug deep down into Naaman's faith and how it relates to this faith series devotionals that you have created for our listeners out there today. And so I want to dig into Naaman's faith, but before I do that, I want to peel back the veil. So go ahead share a little bit about yourself. Okay, I am a Sunday school teacher. And uh, I all, well, before I became a Sunday school teacher, I grew up without any TV, but uh, I had a lot of books. And so I became an avid reader and I knew that I wanted to write. And I also knew that I didn't know the first thing about writing because unlike you, Parker, I'm not necessarily a fictional writer, but I, I love reading fiction. Love it, love it, love it, love it. And I was introduced to biblical fiction at a young age. It was like, wow, this is cool. And so anyway, I put my, um, my dreams on hold because I didn't know what to write about. I really didn't. And I just went on with my life and I never, you know, I dabbled in this and dabbled in that and got my degree and did more dabbling and just, you know, you know, I just, you know, it was much, very much of a dabbling life. But the one thing that the Lord, and I credit the Lord, he kept me close to him, even though I, when I tried to stray away, he brought me back. Amen. Amen. And I thank the Lord that he gave me a tender heart toward him. I truly do. I went through a lot. And uh, so I just thank the Lord for his grace to me, uh, my family and uh, my upbringing. And the Lord was always with me and guiding me and directing me. And so I became a Sunday school teacher and I hated the curriculum that they gave me. So I said, I'm going to make up my own curriculum. Might as well. <laughs> so I did. And I was an old, they were older students. I mean, when we're talking older students, I'm talking 10 to 12. And so, you know, they could read, which was a really good thing. And one of the things that I was taught in Sunday school as a very young Christian was to have daily devotions. And so I thought, well, I'm going to teach these kids to have daily devotions. So I said to them, I said, you know, Every day you eat, every day you sleep, every day you watch TV. So how about if you read the Bible every day and pray every day? And they looked at me like I had two heads. Because you did at that moment. At that moment, you had two heads growing out of your body. 
<laughs> I, I guess I did. I mean, the concept of them reading a verse or two of the Bible every single day was just like, that was a bizarre thought to these kids. And so I repeated that one week and I repeated it the next week. And the next week I said, forget this. And at that point, I had an older lady. She was in her 60s at the time. And she was helping me. I was so glad. And she said, I want to help you because I became a Christian when I was late in life. She said, I never learned Bible stories. I want to sit in your class and help you because I wanted to learn Bible stories. Her name was Burnham. And I said, great, sure, you're more than welcome. And so we started to go back to the devotional thing. Like I get, I gave up on the kids. I said, forget it. You know, I told you I did my part, have devotions. You don't want to do it fine. Don't, I, okay, I'm going to teach you, forget it. Well, who came to me the next week with a list of Bible questions and said, this is what I read. It was Verda. Nice. Nice. I love it. It was, it was such a touching thing. Because, like I said, go back to when I had two hands. She looked at me like I had two hands, too. <laughs> so I was like, okay, Lord, I'm getting through somewhere. I've got this was totally unexpected. I'll take it. Thank you. And so anyway, that started a friendship. It deepened our friendship. And we're still, to this day, we meet once a week and talk about her. She's still, she's reading the Bible now for the third time. She'd read a chapter a day and write down any questions that she had while she would read that. And then she'd come to me with that. So anyway, back to my uh, Sunday school class, I decided, well, we're going to start and I'm going to teach about David because everybody loves David. And so I did. And so, and I was, I, I was teaching that I wanted this children and Perna to not only know that David was alive, this is a historical fact, this is a historical figure, this, was, this is history, but I also wanted them to know how they can take the events of David's life and apply it to their own life. You know, trusting God, you know, just dealing with the things that David had to deal with. They're going to have similar things in their own life. So I tried to make every week very practical. And so when I was done with David, I went on to Esther and did the same thing. And somewhere along the lines, I thought, you know what? This could make a good book. And then I went one step further and I thought to myself, you know, I've been harping on these children to have daily devotionals. Why not make David into a Bible study devotional? And so I did. And just to circle back around Verna, she does not like David. Understandable. She's a bit older and we see beyond the context of what scripture gives us about David. And he is a very complex man. Yes. Uh, one of the things she hated was she thought he was a failure as a husband. But he was. <laughs> but he was a failure. Hey, the man wasn't perfect. He cut me up. Uh, you know, more than one life, you know, you know, I'm going to just stop right there. And I'm, you know, I don't want yeah, to, I we're done. Me. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, it's like, I forced her past that. And, oh, he was a horrible father. Again, you know, the, but the beauty of the Bible is that these people weren't perfect. And there's David with all of his faults, you know, revealed to us in Holy Writ. And you know what? I'm not perfect either. And if God can use David with all of his sins and all of his short and all of it, say oh, that there's a hope for yes, me. Yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, thank you so much. I mean, the Bible is, it's in some ways it's very raw. You know, this is, this is what happened. Good, bad, or different. I'm not saying, you know, God's not saying David was perfect. It was, he was saying, this is what he did. This is what he did. Good. This is what he did. Bad. And one thing I love about David is that he did not, he never turned away to idol worship. He always focused on worshiping uh, God. 
And it's like, good for you. You know, that's what I try to bring out. You know, he wrote the Psalms. Thank, you know, because of David, we have the Psalms, which is a most wonderful book of the Bible. And it embraces so many emotions. And so I brought that into my devotional. So that's how I got into writing books. And so now I am writing books. I think what's interesting is several things that you said. You mentioned about being a Sunday school teacher. And I also had that experience of being a Sunday school teacher for many years. Definitely enjoyed the interaction that I had with my kids. And I was a bit younger when I had them. So I taught from 16 up till in my uh, tw- um, late 20s. So I taught for a very long time. And I had all ages. I had the babies hitting me on the bottom. <laughs> I had the toddler yeah. running around. I had teens. I had the um, tweens the 10 to 12 year olds, I had them all. And I enjoyed every one of my experiences as a Sunday school teacher. And I resonate with that part of your story. I also resonate with you about even though you don't write fiction, you're still a writer. I could never, I just wrote two nonfiction pieces this year and it was agonizing. <laughs> okay. Ooh. I I, 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 could, I don't know how people who write nonfiction, how they do it because it's a different way of thinking and looking at what you're going to present to the reader. Usually I present just oh, yeah. historical romance. How do I take a personal life experience and share it with a reader? That was very humbling. It was an aspect of vulnerability I was not really comfortable with, but accepted it. And the yes. other part was that I was imparting information of things that I knew. So, okay. In essence, I did it. I'm not rushing to do it again. <laughs> so, we'll just keep it like that. But I love that you use these experiences to help you with what's going on right now. And I always use the opportunity of this show to encourage aspiring authors to do the same thing you're doing. Use the gift that God gave you to write. Now you talked about your barbarian days in the world of no TV. (laughs) And the interesting thing is now I don't have TV. After the TV broke, after I got married and the TV broke, we never replaced it. So here we have this book about Naaman and I love how you talk about Naaman. So my question is for the genesis of the story, how did you come to choosing him as a person of interest for your devotional studies? That's a wonderful question. And the fact was I needed a um, lead magnet to get people onto my newsletter list. And so I was told, write a short book because I don't like, this is a personal, personal, personal thing. I don't like giving away a chapter or two of a, uh, a full book because I'm sort of an impatient person sometimes. And if I get uh, one or two chapters, it's just like, where's the other part? I, I, you know, it just spoils it. It's just like, I just, I have to get onto the, you know, so I thought, you know what? I am going to give my readers, my to be readers, a whole book and an eight day devotional. I mean, yeah, an eight day devotional versus a a 30 day devotional. And so when I read name and it's like, here he is. It's just, you know, several little, uh, just several, you know, half of a chapter. And I thought the little maid caught my attention immediately. She's the hero. Yes, she is. Not named. Yes, she is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and here is an unnamed, probably orphaned child who has so much faith in God, so much love to give that she just changed this man world. And so it's like, I, I gotta get this, I gotta get this girl in somewhere. And so that's why I thought, okay, this make a perfect lead magnet because I can write about her. I can write about Naaman and, you know, bring Naaman out in public. And it's actually bring out that little Israelite girl out in public. And so that's how Naaman came to be because it wasn't enough that I could make a 30 day devotional like most of my devotionals, but it's like, just has to come out. This, this is something that I want to write about. And so by God's grace, I did. And I love it. It's one of my favorite, my personal favorites. 
And I love how you have her thoughts interspersed throughout this devotional. And it's it's wonderful. And pick up fiction, by the way. I'm just going to tell you that. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that. Thank you. Pick it up. I think you are uh, tapping, not tapping into that part of your writing ability. But of course, I'm going to encourage you. <laughs> Is that? I do like writing, you know, ever since uh, my my second I have two books only that don't use fiction, but I found that my readers like when I use fiction because I wanted to bring people, make people aware that these people really did live. And there's more to them one than what the Bible records. Uh, I mean, these people love, they had losses. They got a mad at their husband. You know, it's like they lived life just like we do today. And so that's when I, I bring this, um, the fictional part into my devotionals now. And I find a lot of people really resonate to that. And it makes the characters, it makes the Bible narrative come alive in my readers' minds. And that's my desire. One thing I think people sometimes forget is throughout time, there are billions of nobodies who we don't know a thing about. We don't know a thing about. And then the Lord reminds us that even if we don't know who they are, he does. And yes. Little Maid represents that. Your story may seem insignificant to Naaman's story, but you're actually the catalyst <laughs> for Naaman's story. You are important to the Lord. And I say Billy the Nobody is not to degrade anyone's life. It's not that. It's that we don't know who they are. And millions right. of people have come and gone that we'll never know their names till we get to heaven. Until we see. Right. But I think that's important to remember that the Lord knows who the nobody is. And in this case, it's the little maid. And, you know, the nobodies are important for him. You know, I mean, we all know big names, but the nobodies are very important to the Lord. And he uses them and he knows and he records and he will reward them. And thank you for bringing that out. I just thought it was important to mention that because Naaman's presence does take up a large part of the story and his hardheadedness and his reluctance and all the things that you mentioned in this devotional. But again, she's the one who really drives the story. So that fictional part really adds that added oomph to the story that I think our readers were like. And dear reader, make sure you go ahead and pick up your free copy, Naaman's Faith, an eight-day Bible study devotional for women based on the account of Naaman in 2 Kings 5. So let's go ahead and dig into this a little bit. I wanted to read a quick excerpt from here because I thought how profound it was. And to preface this with popular culture, Mary, there's a show called Hoarders. And it, okay, Hoarders is an, an addicting show that's extremely sad <laughs> because these people are hoarding trash. They're hoarding trash. They're not hoarding, and they think the trash is priceless. And the rest of the world says, yeah, it's covered in rat poop. So, and it's very interesting, but I could see the parallel here when it came to leprosy. So I'm going to read just a quick excerpt here. Yes. Leprosy was the scourge of Damon's time. It is also a picture of the disease yeah. of sin. Lepers called the walking dead. Yeah. After zombies, guide, <laughs> Evoked fear, dread, and revulsion. The disease usually starts with pain, quickly followed by numbness. As the disease progresses, spots in the skin become dirty sores and ulcers. Facial skin becomes both deeply furrowed and grotesquely swollen, making the person appear similar to a mangled wild beast. Their fingers and toes either drop off or are absorbed by the progressive swelling. Their voices become hoarse as the disease infects their vocal cords. Lepers were driven from society because this debilitating disease was contagious. Like leprosy, sin starts inside the body in the heart of man, and then it shows on the outside in a person's actions. God says the heart is desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, 9. As sin advances, it numbs the individual to its evil effect, while it corrupts and defiles both the person and others. Sin, like leprosy, is contagious. And like leprosy, the disease of sin leads to death. Sin is the cause of physical death and spiritual death. 
eternal separation from God in hell. Even while people are physically alive, their sin makes them dead spiritually and separates them from a holy God. So you can understand the severity of Naaman's situation. Now, Mary did use leprosy to show what sin is like in a way that's quite vivid. But we have seen, for example, drug addicts who are addicted to heroin and what it does to the relationships of that person to their body to where only the drug keeps them going. Just like with hoarders, you can see people holding on to trash, spiritually hoarding, physically hoarding. So you see these various depictions of real life things that can really be attributed to how sin acts in our life. So in a way, the story of Naaman is a story about sin and how we can be free from sin. So that's my little preface about this story. Do you agree with my summary or? I do. I love it. I really love it. It always amazes me how other people uh, get different angles, shall I say, of what I write. And I, I thank the Lord for that. So I want to talk about two of these devotional passages in the book because it's an eight-day book. It's free. Go ahead, pick up your copy today. You're not going to be disappointed. But the first one I want you to elaborate on is Elisha's instructions. Now go ahead, give us a brief detail about who Elisha is first and what he's telling Naaman. So I'm not going to have Mary give you the full story of Naaman. I'm going to encourage you to pick up the book because it is free. Go ahead, pick it up. It's free. (laughs) So go ahead, tell us a little bit about Elisha and what his instructions were to Naaman. Well, the fact was the little maid had told, uh, referred Naaman via his wife, me and Naaman's wife, to the prophet of God, Elisha. And so anyway, Naaman, uh, who was very, um, what shall I say, he was very well known. He was a war hero and very, look, you know, he was a superstar of the day, of his day. And so anyway, he went to Elisha and said, hey, I'm a leper and I was sent here. And Elisha did not even have the courtesy of meeting him face to face. And that put Naaman, who was used to adoring crowds, it sort of put him aback. It's like, what? You know, I came all this distance and, you know, he's going to make a big show and, you know, it's going to be something that all the neighbors can watch and he's going to call on God and put his hand on me and heal me from leprosy and Bilal will be healed. And Elisha said, no, you know, he sent word via his messenger. He says, go to that dirty river and wash. And Naaman was bad. Well, you can't blame the guy. You know, this is the this is uh, ancient Eastern region. You know, what I mean? and yeah. there's a lot of pomp and circumstance involved. Yeah. in this. Oh, yeah. And you have to understand the insult here. It's not that he he sits some little servant to this big recognized leader. That's like if we see, let's say, the president of the United States at our door, we send our doll to go handle a pa- <laughs> handle a piece of paper. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, really? So think about it like that, dear listener. Go ahead and continue. Oh yeah, no, I, I totally get it. Because he didn't have TV either. So this is gonna <laughs> be <laughs> You know, this is gonna be, you know, a lot of like you said, popping circumstance, you know, that the you know, get all the neighborhood together and you know. And it was it was demeaning. Um, it was really an insult to Naaman's pride. And so he's like, "Okay, you know, go wash." And it's like, "This is the dirtiest river," and the the Jordan River was so dirty. And yes, he, he argued with him. He said, "You know, I want to. You know, if I have to wash the river, let me go home and choose a clean one." You know. <laughs> and again, you know, you can't blame him. And finally, he. Name is said, okay, fine. I'm going to go do it. <laughs> and so he did. And he dipped himself in the river. I mean, his servants actually had to talk him into this. And the servants, you know, they were a voice of reason. And they said, come on now. He's not asking you to do a great thing. And the servants showed their love for their master because they wanted him healed. And so they were just trying to help him 
the voice of reason. And it's like, you know what? Give it a try. It's not going to hurt you. And so he did. And just like he was told, he came up clean and it was a miracle. And so I think in that part with Naaman at his very, his anger, I just love the servants, you know, being kind, being humble, and actually having faith that Naaman didn't have. And sometimes we need people around here to say, go ahead. You know, God uses the people. And again, like you said, the, the nobodies, those were those servants. Just like the little maid, those were the servants. And so they were very powerful in this part of Naaman's life. And I'm sure Naaman was very, very, very thankful for them because I don't know what would have happened had Naaman uh, just like stomp off and, said, and went home and said, no, it didn't work. Well, no, no, no. Elisha's instructions via God did work as he saw, but he needed some encouragement from those people who cared about him to actually do what he was supposed to do. And Naaman's story has a lot of depth to it. So I encourage you to also read the biblical narrative of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5, because Naaman doesn't just come up clean physically. He literally says, I am bowing down to this God. Because no one else could do what he did. Yes. And one thing you say here in the devotional, and I just want to touch on it. You said that Elisha didn't, didn't show up, but God did. He showed up. And if Elisha had acted any differently, I would wonder, because of how Naaman is, I would wonder would he have given his allegiance to Elisha as the man instead of God as the one who actually healed them. It's interesting. Know, you're probably right, Parker. And I like that you brought that up. I really do. Because, uh, and you know, it's, it's a thing because God uses us. And it's God. It's not us. It's God. And we don't let, I mean, our flesh wants people look at us. But we need to be like Jesus Christ. It says, it's for my father. It's for my father. It's for my father. Look past me. Look at God. And you're right. You're probably very, very right because just knowing who Naaman was, he would he needed to look past the man of God to the God. Especially in this time period, God's obvi yes. of the day. They didn't have atheists. You believed in something, okay? Yes. If it was the yes. Ashtaroth, Baal, Molech, uh, uh, Chemosh, whoever it was, gods were the order of the day. And of course, that comes to another part of uh, biblical theology we won't get into today. But but uh, God's with the order of the day. And so if Elijah had acted any differently, Naaman probably would have given his allegiance to him. But we don't know. Again, we're only going by what the Lord decided right. to share with us in the biblical narrative. And there's so much more to this little story. Go ahead, pick up your copy of Naaman's Fate. It's available online on Amazon for free. You can download it for free. And after that, you're going to be able to get the other books in this Faith Series Devotional for Women series. The first one is David's Faith. The second is Esther's Faith. The third is Joseph's Faith. The fourth is Abraham's Faith. The fifth is, is Jonah's Faith. And so all of these are available are available for purchase on Amazon, but go ahead and pick up the free one today, name and save. And I assure you, you won't be disappointed. So in a few moments that we have left, Mary, I want people to have an opportunity to connect with you online. Yes, you can go to my blog website. It's um, maryjanehumes.com. And that's the best way to get a hold of me. Awesome. I didn't know if you had any social media outlets that people want to connect with you as well, or is everything I'm on your website? Slowly but surely getting everything on my website. You can also email me. The easiest way to e email me is hello at maryjanehumes.com. That's the easiest way because I'm not a big fan of social media at this point. And so um, anyway, hello at maryjanehumes.com is my email address. And that's the best way. Drop me a line and say hello. In the few moments we have left, what I want to do, Mary, is mute myself and I'm going to have you pray for us that we have faith like Naaman and that we have faith like the little like the little mate. And go ahead and pray for us and pray as the Lord leads you. Okay, I will. Thank you. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, so much for Parker. I thank you, Lord, for using us, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that because of technology, that you could bring us together, both Parker, myself, and all that are listening, and all who are, will listen to this podcast. Because you have said where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. And there, Lord, I pray that you would just use uh, what you have given to us, Lord, as ladies, to be able to help others, Lord, who are struggling with their faith. Lord, I pray that you would draw people closer to thee who know you. And Lord, for those who don't know you as of yet, I pray that you'd be working in their hearts, Lord Jesus, to bring them to thee, to point of salvation, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you, Lord, for Naaman. I thank you for the little maid. And I thank you, Lord, that nobody is a nobody to you, but that we're all special. I thank you, Lord, for that. And I pray that you would just use us, Lord, and help us, Lord, to be able to point always to you, to give you the honor and the glory and the praise, because of you, we can do things, but Lord, it's you who do this. And Lord, I just pray that you may be glorified, Lord, in our ministry, in our families, Lord, that you might be lifted up. And I pray and ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful prayer, Mary. Thank you so much, so much for that prayer. And thank you for being with me on the show today. Can't wait to have you back. And she's coming back, guys, real soon. Well, thank you, Parker. And we were talking today to Mary J. Humes. She is the author of the book, Naaman's Faith. Go ahead and pick up your copy of it today. It is for free, available on Amazon.com. What are you waiting for? Do you want to get stronger in your faith? Do you want the Lord to change your sin sick life into something better? Do you want to hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Do you want to be that little maid to lead someone to Christ? Do you want to be the servants to encourage someone who is struggling in their obedience to God to say, is it really that hard? Do you want to be where the Lord puts you? Go ahead, pick up your copy of Naaman's Faith and then all the rest of the books in the Faith Series devotionals. You won't be disappointed. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of the Parker J. Cole Show. You have a wonderful, absolutely glorious, blessed day. And God bless. <music>